This episode is dedicated to any dentist in the world who thinks that resin bonded bridges, or dare I say Maryland bridges, are a temporary or short-term solution. I've got plenty of friends in North America and in Singapore who felt that way. And I just feel like it's a massive misconception because resin bonded bridges or sticky bridges or adhesive bridges, call them what you want, they are such a fantastic and underutilized treatment modality to replace missing teeth. Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galati, and it's no secret that I'm a huge fan of these bridges. I've published about this technique before and it's something that I did a lot of in dental hospital and I took this into private practice. And the funny thing is that when I started to work in the practice that I work in now in Reading, the dentist whose list I inherited, who was working there for 30 plus years, he was also a huge fan of resin bonded bridges. So I've had the privilege of looking after and reviewing patients who've had their resin bonded bridges, both anterior and posterior in service for 34 years, 32 years, loads in the 27, 28 year mark, plenty in the 20 year plus mark. So he was fantastic at doing them. It really validated my belief system in resin boron bridges. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Jazz, that's like N equals 15. How is that even valid in this world of evidence-based dentistry? Well, let me tell you, the evidence is out there and we will discuss it today because resin boron bridges are extremely successful in the right cases. And we'll discuss what those cases are and what clinical protocols we use to get that kind of success. Because I'm joined today by budding prosthodontist, Dr. Salman Primahamid, who you may remember from episode 97 about face bows. If you want to learn more about face bows, when to use them, when not to use them, you can go back and listen to that episode. Now, for this one, I've got a protrusive dental pearl for you, which is relevant to resin bridges, but also all types of indirect work. The pearl is to always picture your path of insertion. Now, when I say path of insertion, most people usually think dentures, right? We were always taught about get a path of insertion, a path of removal for your denture. But path of insertion is also relevant to crowns, onlays, and resin bridges or any type of bridge. When you look at your prep, you have to visualize how is a technician going to insert and remove this indirect piece of dentistry? Because sometimes when you've got adjacent teeth that are tilted, it can really complicate getting a good path of insertion. In fact, recently had a tricky case where I wasn't able to achieve a vertical path of insertion for my onlay. So me and the technician agreed for a buckle path of insertion. It worked really well. It's not something I do routinely or I want to do, but it's just something that worked out for me. And it's really important to just keep that in mind, especially when it comes to resin bonded bridges, which we're talking about today. Whenever I'm doing a prep for resin bonded bridge, and, and let me tell you now, let me give you a spoiler, is that there's not much prep involved but that doesn't mean no prep. Minimal prep can often mean making guide planes and reducing maximum velocity. So we'll talk about that today, but a little bit of work can go a long way to get a more desirable path of insertion. Let's join Dr. Salman Pir Mohammed now for the main episode on resin bond bridges, which I hope will change your mind. If you're someone who is a doubter, a non-believer, then I'm hoping that will convert you to thinking a bit more about using resin bond bridges successfully in general practice for definitive and long-term replacements of missing teeth. Salman Pir Mohammed, welcome back for the second time to the Petrusa Dental Podcast. We had you before on the face bows. You know, all about when and why to use a face bow, and you did such a great job. And we've been geeking out on social media. By the way, your posts, dental underscore story, you got to follow that account. It's, it's brilliant, so educational. I'm loving it. And you've been posting a lot about resin and bridges. So let's come on and let's help those who are either not warming up to the idea to resin and bridges, and we'll talk a lot about that, or who just want to improve their workflow. But for those who didn't listen, to that episode yet, please remind ourselves, tell us where you're at in your career at the moment, Salman. Tell us how you fell in love, like I did, with Reservoir and Bridges. Okay, so Jazz, just to introduce myself again, because that was quite a while ago, we did that podcast on Facebook. So my name is Salman, I qualified about six years ago. Um, I'm currently at the Eastman doing my specialist training in prosthodontics, and that's three days a week. And I spend other three days a week in very busy practice, as Jazz found out this morning, uh, from my day list. Three days a week in general practice, uh, doing a combination of restorative and implant work. Resin on the bridges, like the real passion, came about from quite a few things, actually. Uh, the first thing, as Jazz mentioned, I've been posting a lot of kind of clinical cases on my Instagram page. And the topic I get the most questions about is always resin on the bridges, and mainly from the international crowd. So I think the UK-based dentists use this a lot more. And maybe NHS hospitals have changed the way we replace missing teeth. But the people abroad, they're like, what are you doing? You must be doing something wrong here. How is this working? How is the occlusion settling down? And that's why I thought this podcast might be a good idea. And I'm happy that Jai's invited me on because I feel quite privileged 
uh, to be in a crowd of the people that he gets on. Oh, mate, it, it's, it's so good because I, I see the kind of cases you do. And you also told me that the Eastman, you, you guys are really pushing the boat. You guys are really pushing it to the extreme limit in terms of what can be possible with Reservoir and Bridges. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later in terms of, okay, how far can you go? Uh, but yes, please carry on. And the second reason is because at the Eastman, as part of our specialist training, we have to have a thesis project or a dissertation topic. And my one's been on patient satisfaction. It's going to sound like quite a long title, but patient satisfaction for replacement of missing lateral incisors and comparing orthodontic camouflage, dental implants, and reservoir on the bridges. And what's odd is that we often recommend patients different clinical solutions, but a lot of it's not actually evidence-based. A lot of prosthodontics is opinion. A lot of it is expert opinion, we say, on what we learn from our teachers and our VT trainers along the years. And I'm finding that from the research that I read, actually, that resin on the bridges come up with an almost equal or even higher patient satisfaction rate than dental implants. And then Jazz, so I'll finish the story here, but the last reason I got interested in resin on the bridges is I started at a new private practice um, about a year ago, um, mainly to do some implant work. And I thought we're doing a lot of implants and a high number of them. And these patients were coming in for free implant consultations, and it's a great way to improve my communication skills. But what happened is they were all walking out with true implants for resin on the bridges. And my principal flagged <laughs> up, he said, what's going on? We're not ordering any implants anymore. And I just realized that they're kind of a really underutilized treatment modality. Um, that can give a massive benefit to our patients. And I'm sure Jazz can share the same stories with the ones that he's done also. H hugely underutilized. And that's the first thing I want to tackle with you today, Salman, because just to give you a little bit of story, when I was practicing in Singapore, if you, you remember, I used to be in Singapore some years, and that's when I realized that actually it's only in the UK and maybe some few select other countries in Europe that reservoir and bridges are done to a high standard with good longevity and are popular. That even in the UK, you know, when people talk about it on Facebook, and they say it's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. You know, it needs a wing and a prayer and all those funny jokes come out and whatnot. But I realized it to the extreme level when I was in Singapore, because not only did the local Singaporean dentists have zero faith in reservoir and bridges, the US dentists that were working as expat dentists in Singapore had zero faith in reservoir and bridges. Like they thought it was like, it just it's, it's a very, very temporary solution before you have an implant. That was the only sort of indication for reservoir and bridge. And, and even then they weren't convinced by that. And, the, and so what happened, and the third reason why I think it's underutilized is commercial. Because what happened when I was in Singapore, I was working for a corporate, I'd written my paper by then, Dental Update, so, and I was doing a bit of public speaking in Singapore, and I said, hey guys, you know what, we have our monthly corporate study clubs, I'd be more than happy to, to come in, because I realized no one's doing these, I'm more than happy to share with you some protocols, so everyone can feel more confident doing resume and bridges. They, ne they always reply to my emails, they never reply to that one, okay, because... The most of the lectures were about implants and referring to their in-house specialists for implants because what's going to generate more money, okay? Implants. Now, by the way, one I thing we can touch that. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I would argue with you and I would agree with you that actually if you do resume bridges well and you charge for them, they give you a good hourly rate and how many years you get out of it in terms of how much you spend, that ratio will be good as well. And I know you're going to go in that scenario. But as a commercial viewpoint, this corporate... Does it want to push its dentist to refer to implantologists for multiple implants versus, oh, let's do a resin and bridge? I think they had a commercial motive, n not knowing that, okay, resin and bridges can work well as well. So that is some of the things that I found when I was there. How about you, my friend? Because you've been reached out with, on social media, international dentists not having faith. Why do you think they're underutilized? I think with the American dentists a lot, they, they actually do a lot of resin on the bridges, but it's always seen as a temporary solution. So the implant guys will always show like a big surgery and then I have a resin on the bridge in situ and I say, yeah, we'll, we'll take it off in three months and then restore the implants. And I just think like, what well, if you just left it on, how long would it have lasted? Because it's been pretty predictable so far without proper like bonding protocols or material selection. And one thing that's really funny, Jazz, with like a resin on the bridges, with as UK dentists, <laughs> we're often made fun of from the rest of the world in terms of our occlusal management, in terms of our restorative case selection. But I think in this one scenario, there's a lot that we can teach other people or, or just share different different treatment modalities because it's working in this public healthcare system that's kind of really made this treatment modality so successful. The great thing about working in a hospital is yes, there's less risk involved. When things fail, patients are not paying, the replacements for free. But it's when we've really pushed the boundaries to the extreme where then the more routine cases become so predictable when I do them in private practice over here and charge patients appropriately for what you do because it will give them that quality of life that they want. So someone just a little history uh, lesson for us. How far have Resmar Bridges come over the years in terms of technology? Why are they in a better place now in terms of our protocols? So Jazz, I think like enamel bonding has been around for, I think 70 or 80 years, a long time ago with Bjorn Accor in a study on acid and acrylic bonding um, and enamel etching. And then Resmar the Bridges started about 50 years ago, initially as Rochette Bridges. So you'd have this metal retainer that'd be stuck to a tooth 
and you'd have holes within this retainer because everyone could stick, figure out how to bond to the enamel, but no one could figure out how to bond to the metal. So they made these big holes and they did macro mechanical retention with like GIC or even composite resin cement. We then went ahead and the University of Maryland figured out electrochemical etching. We did basically figured out that if you do a specific procedure to the metal, then our resin cements will bond really predictably. And Maryland bridges is kind of stuck as a terminology, but actually the correct term is now resin bonded bridges because we don't do the electrolytic etching the way the University of Maryland did. Curare came up with MDP primer, which has changed zirconia bonding and changed metal bonding. And that MDP allo primer is how we figured out how to get really predictable bond strengths. And it's specifically to non-precious metals because they're the ones that get a thick oxide layer. You have very predictable bonding. And that's how it started. And now it's come even further. And now we're looking at zirconia resin on the bridges. But yeah, it's, it's, it's been a massive evolution in the last 50 years. It certainly has now. A couple of points there. Maryland Bridge, I know, is not the appropriate term to use anymore. But you know what? With my patients, I do use it. With my clinical community, I use resmoran bridges. Patients identify really well with Maryland. They don't like the term res. I've just trialed it, you know. If it has a nice ring to it, Maryland. Oh, why is it called Maryland? Oh, from the USA. Oh, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> I like it. Resmoran yeah. bridges sound too, it's too jargony. So that's the only time. I call it a sticky, I call it a a sticky bridge. bridge. Sticky bridges are also a good one. So, so that's, that's good. Uh, and then as they evolved in terms of how we use it, and I think it's really great you mentioned about the uh, MDP being so important and allowing us to get some confidence and a lot of the studies that were done in the UK and abroad, but so much good stuff coming out from UK authors, which is why I think it's done so well. Like my principal, who was in the same practice for 34 years and who I took over from. So he was leaving the practice, no longer the principal, as I took over. So all these patients in their 60s and 70s, I've taken over their list. They've all been seeing Giles for 34 years. Loads of them have resin bond bridges. And then I've seen quite a few which have been there for 32 years. I've seen some for 25 years and maybe at like the 15 year mark once it came away. And, and, and that's it. And that's just because uh, I'm interested in this. I'd like to ask those patients, but so many of them have lasted so long and patients are, are really happy. But back to that question I was going to ask you is, to what degree do you think it can actually facilitate or become functional for the patient. As in your sticky bridge, your resume bridge, do you expect your patient to be able to function on them? Yes, yeah, so I have a very like long consent process for my resume on the bridges. And as time goes on, even though I feel they're becoming more predictable, I think we've always done the thing just of under-promise and uh, over-deliver, right? And resume on the bridges are very much like the rest of our treatment modalities. And when I give a patient their treatment options, the resin on the bridge solution for me is a non-invasive solution that has all the benefits of aesthetics and I promise them really good aesthetics with that Pontic. If I'm going for a metal retainer, I'll warn them of the suboptimal aesthetics with the metal retainer and I'm often going for incisal overlaps. When it comes to discussing function... And we, we will, by the way, we will, for those listening, we will talk about incisal overlap later. It's really important. So we will touch on that in terms of designing your resin bridge. But yes, please carry on. And for me, when I go to functional units, I tell the patient this is not a true functional unit. Because if you think about it, you've got one fake tooth attached to one real tooth and one real tooth is taking two tooths weight. And so I'll say, always be gentle with this tooth. Don't use it like a normal tooth. In the back of my mind, I think if they use it like a regular tooth, they probably function just as well as a regular tooth. But I always want them to be careful. If there's one, if they've got one resin on the bridge in their mouth and the remaining unrestored dentition, I want them to be avoiding this area of the mouth because naturally that will prolong the longevity of what we're providing. We know that our cements are good in compression and they're not so good in tension. And I design my retainers in such a way that generally that retainer is always going to be under compressive load. But if the patient is careless with it, bites on a fork in the wrong way, hits in the wrong direction, that's when your cements are gonna fail. And often if you talk to patients as to how did this resin on the bridge come off, it's not usually just a random chewing motion, it's usually, oh, I knocked it, or something happened and then it came off and I regret doing that. So they do work in function, but in terms of consent of patients, I say it's not a true functional unit and that's the best way to look at it. Because the majority of my resin on the bridges have been done for aesthetic reasons, not for functional reasons. And if it's posterior teeth, which I'm sure we'll go through later, it's a very, very different discussion. 100% agree. And so the commonly replacing lateral incisors, you know, using a canine or a central. So that's the most common scenario. And even lower incisors, which I'm really passionate about. I'm so passionate about how we often use reservoir and bridges to replace lateral incisors. And one thing I'm really passionate about, Salman, and I don't know if you are as well, is I think as a international consensus in dentistry, you know how they had the, the York uh, Gill consensus, consensus about yeah. the, the, the standard of care should be two lower implants for the lower dentist person, right? I think the standard of care for a missing lower incisor where appropriate should be a resin minor bridge okay exhibit a 
Yeah, <laughs> exhibit A. I've got my own resin monobridge bridge replacing my two lateral incisors after some orthodontics, so it's one a pontic space. And I have seen, I don't know if you've seen it before, some implants in place in a lower incisor region that's just been an absolute nightmare. And so I always think such a narrow space and I've got good. a better. I've got a better story for you, Jens. Oh, go on, go on. <laughs> so I'm taking this audio clip from my. I'm taking this podcast from my practice tonight, right now. My principal, about 15 years ago, his associate was doing an implant training program, and my principal had hyperdontia of his lower incisor, so he had an implant placed, uh, squeezed in between the two lower incisors, and about eight years later, he began having the complications from it. Uh, so he lost both of the adjacent teeth. And uh, he's now lost three incisors. And it's mainly because someone tried to squeeze an implant. And for an implant, you need that seven millimeters of incidental root space, uh, which there wasn't in that case. And for me, the solution, I know there's narrower implants out with these implant companies, but often it's just easier to look at a simpler solution, like a resin on the bridge. My principal now has a resin on the bridge, which runs from the lower right canine to the lower left canine. And that's lasted mm-hmm. with him all these years. He didn't go for another implant solution because he had that bad experience in the past. And I think we also need to look at modes of failure, right? Um, If you try squeezing an implant in, what are you going to cause? What's the complications of it? Just because the patient pays more initially, it doesn't mean things will last. They may last longer, but the cost of complications is a lot greater. So there's a lot of factors to consider. Lower incisor region, for sure, 100%. So that's the main message uh, I gave. And, you know, I talk the talk, but I I walk the walk when it comes to that. But uh, on that topic of, of function, so part of my consent is... I teach my patients about how it works and I, I really say like, you know, can you believe that we just stuck a bit of a thin strip of metal to your tooth? Like how amazing is that? It's just stuck onto your tooth. Now, can you imagine someone just peeling it away and they're like, oh yeah, it could peel away. So I say, look, you can do what you want. Just be careful not to bite sellotape on it, not to bite into a baguette and tear the baguette using your fake tooth. You can use the good tooth next door, but you can't use my fake tooth. So anything that requires you to put the food first or a tool on that fake tooth and you're going to lever it off. And I think that message really gets through them. The whole tearing the baguette, tearing a crisp packet. And I think as long as you avoid that, these sort of freak of nature kind of incidents, you know, getting elbowed and stuff, then they enjoy a really good longevity. And patients don't often think about it during function to avoid it or anything like that. It's more about not doing anything stupid with it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, fully agree, completely. It's just about advising those patients properly about how to take care of it. So it lasts them the longest time possible, completely. So on the topic of lasting as long as possible, case selection criteria. Because I'm sure dentists message you saying, is this suitable? And I get lots of messages saying, is this case suitable? And thankfully, the ones I get are quite sensible, actually. The, the ones I get quite sensible, I don't get the too too many far-fetched ones thinking eh, it's a bit of a push. Occasionally you get one which is suboptimal. So let's talk about what are the kind of features that I think that lend themselves to a reservoir bridge and then what are the features that don't? Or what are the red flags, right? Essentially, what do you avoid? Red flags. Yeah. How can we avoid yeah, being it. too ambitious? Hmm. So let's go through like the positives first, the things that lend themselves towards a good resume on the bridge. I think for me, like first thing is enamel. It's just enamel, enamel, enamel. I, and I know people talk about dentin bonding now, but for me, enamel bonding is what's always giving me predictability for my resume on the bridges. And I'm very open and honest about my failures too, even on my Instagram. I've had two resume on the bridges that failed, and one of them was pushing the limits, and it's purely because of substrate that I bonded to. Um, I was trying to replace a lower incisor, and both of the adjacent teeth were post full mouth reconstruction and had quite a lot of composite on them. And I thought, I can get by, I can want to composite, it's fresh. And it didn't work. And it's purely that quantity and quality of enamel that I'd say is the first main thing you need for predictability of your resume on the bridge. 100%, 100%. 100%. And, Would you agree? and then also, uh, yes, please. I was going to say one thing I know we'll touch on is favorable occlusions and unfavorable occlusions, yes. but I know you're going to mm-hmm. come to that as well. So, ideal patient, anterior open bite. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. the ones you want, right? Yeah, for the anterior exactly. ones. Class two, the huge class two div ones, anterior yeah. open bites. <laughs> yeah, and class two div twos, I guess the opposite. Exactly, yeah. So, I'd say bruxists are for me a warning flag uh, for resin on the bridges, especially when I try to maybe go further back in the mouth to replace some missing teeth. So for me, a resin on the bridge is usually want your retaining tooth to be larger than your pontic tooth or more stable. So people often look at either replacing lateral incisors of the centrals or the canines. I'm quite happy to do that because the mouth, we know it acts like a lever. The functional forces are heavier at the back of the mouth, uh, like a nutcracker, and the lower at the front. So for me, a resin on the bridges will last better at the front of the mouth. More and more people say, why don't you do posterior resin on the bridges? And I have shown a few cases of mine on social media but for me, they're really, really, really case selective. So for me, a posterior resin on the bridge to replace, for example, an upper second premolar of a first molar is it needs to be the perfect case. There needs to be some existing interviews of space. I don't want to be relying on the dull approach too much. 
Um, because I know the inclusive forces there will be greater. And that's why I'm more worried about Bruxists. The first ever group function I did was a question someone asked about, can you do DAL using the reservoir and bridge technique? And yes, obviously we, we can. But then when I talk about that scenario with a first molar and an adult, I'm, I'm a bit more reluctant in practice yeah, no, to, to do that. But in, in, you know, in hospital, I'm sure you're seeing loads of these 17-year-olds, post-orthodontic, hyperdontia, uh, probably using the canine as the abutment tooth in DAL. So the only contacts are on the retainers and then everything just settles. Am, am I right that you guys still doing that uh, in terms of replacing lateral incisors just yeah or yeah that's a routine case for us yeah uh, to be honest i just had a, i just fitted a resume on the bridge to replace uh, an upper five often upper six and we often know that post ortho patients may not end up in the most standardized occlusion <laughs> so this lady <laughs> to put it, um, to put it we were investigating <laughs> yeah so <laughs> i'm very diplomatic just <laughs> so um, we were looking at the existing volume of bone to replace the upper second premolar and we did all the implant planning She'd been consented, we took a CBCT, and we found there was like half a millimeter of bone height. And it had been a major sinus lift to make an implant work in that area. And when I took the study costs back to the lab as we do at the hospital and actually mounted them on the articulator, I noticed that the patient's palatal cusp on her sixes was fully out of function completely. There's about a millimeter and a half of opening. And for me, it was just screaming out resin on the bridge. Um, like you can bring the six back into function, you can keep your five prontic almost out of occlusion and very, very light occlusion. And we wrapped the whole wing around the entire portion of that first molar. I've got a photo of it, Jazz, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Would that help at this stage? Yeah, l let's do that. So for those guys listening right now, we're going to skip. You won't get to obviously see the cases because you're listening, you're not watching. But those watching on the YouTube or the app, which is going to be accessed for, for general soon, you'll be able to see the video. But for, we're going to skip past the video put components for those listening. Please describe what you see, my friend. I, obviously, people are watching, but yeah, sh sh tell us about this case. Is that is that the case that you just described? Exactly. So this is the resume on the bridge case. You're planning an implant replacement, replacing the upper second premolar. And you can see when we had these articulated study cusps, the buccal cusps, this patient's six was actually in crossbite. So her upper buccal cusps are in function, but the palatal cusp over here was totally out of function. And so we managed to make a really thick, bulky looking retainer, which had a maximal wraparound, which didn't interfere with the occlusal scheme at all. So we managed to give her a nice looking second premolar with a partial occlusal coverage of the six with a wraparound metal retainer. And Jazz, when I tried this retainer, when I tried the resin on the bridge, even without cement, I could barely get it off the tooth. That's a very good point. And that's all about respecting the path of insertion. If you've got a nice path of insertion, uh, that really helps as well with some of stability. Also having an adjacent tooth next door as well will help into positional stability as well, which is a good thing. And so that's one case. And to be honest, I have got dull cases of sixes too, where I have had to do them on, on some patients because some patients are not keen on implant surgery and they say, is there any other option? And I think as part of that consent process, as long as we advise them of the risks of different options, we do do it. So this is a patient. I fitted a resin on the bridge in super occlusion. So this is an upper six again, replacing an upper second premolar. It's full occlusal coverage and we maximize it all the way. And you can see the occlusion is propped open. And I think Jazz, your international audience might be listening, wondering what are these guys talking about? But yeah, this patient was out of occlusion on the anterior teeth and they came back in about three weeks into stable ICP contacts. So it does work, but my case selection is very much younger patients. I love the amount of wraparound you have on all on the occlusal surface there. I mean, that is textbook from the classic studies. That looks really great. And for those wondering what the hell is a dial technique, please check out the episodes with Tiff Qureshi. We talk all about the dial and there's some, just want to point out, there's some great work being done in the UK by Riaz Yar, really looking deeply into each and every dial case monitoring them, getting digital prime scan records at every stage, T-scan records before and after. So watch your space, because I think the dial technique, understanding of how the biomechanics of it works is about to go a notch higher, which is really exciting. Yeah, so I, I'm not someone who's gonna advocate putting resume on the bridges at the back of everyone's mouth. So firstly, the mouth is a lever. And for every millimeter we open up at the back, we're opening up three millimeters at the front. And so your case selection needs to be really good. Because if you've put a one millimeter thick resume on the bridge retainer at the back, you'll open up three times as much at the front, but it works the reverse way around. If you have a resume on the bridge anteriorly in super occlusion, you're not waiting for much posterior dial to take place. And the issue with dial is it's by its nature unpredictable. We don't actually know what's happening, which tooth is intruding, which one's extruding. And so you need to really limit your reliance on it as much as possible. So I'll, very, I'll pick these posterior RVBs for very, very similar cases. And I'm like you guys, the, the more I work in private practice, the more I think, should this patient just go for an implant is a bit more predictable in specific situations. But for anterior teeth, it's almost my go-to approach when I've got sound, good volume of enamel. I'll show you a risky one. Can you see this? Oh, man. 
<laughs> check this out the same thing but in zirconia man but this was a very favorable patient like i had a lot of space here it's just the way it worked out but this is uh, it's been going strong for about three years now so far wow. uh, but yeah this did give me, send shivers down my spine as i was gluing this is like am i doing the right thing here so guys so guys yeah. as you can see it's a, a cantilever resbiron bridge and oh gosh we didn't even talk about that actually the importance of cantilever as the standard design of choice and a lot of this busting this myth that actually you need to go for a fix fix so just talk about that someone yeah Jazz, you know, I recently had like a change of, not a change of heart, I'd say. So the evidence that everyone wants to look at is there's a PA King paper, 2015, which was the one done at University of Bristol. They went through like a whole bunch of resume on the bridges in a hospital setting. So about 800, I think it was. The good thing about looking at that paper is they fitted them in all parts of the mouth. And it was done by a variety of people in different, like different levels of specialty training, different registrars, SHOs, consultants, and looking at differences in success rate between those people. But... For me, Jazz, fix, fix, and cancel, but I think it reported like a two and a half times increased failure rate for the fix, fix resin on the bridges. 2.34, I think, or 2.74. But for me, it's, it's a bit of cause and effect also. Like, so I've noticed that people will often sometimes pick a fix, fix resin on the bridge when they think it may not work in that specific situation. And so they're pushing the boundary <laughs> and then they go for the fix, fix bridge and then they get that unilateral deep one. And I completely understand that the benefit of having cantilever resin on the bridges is you know when it's debonded, you know it's come off, you know you have to fix it. Or with fix fix, if you get a unilateral debond, you get that secondary carries and you never figure out that debonded in the first place. But I'm sure there's some cause and effect hypothesis happening here, Jazz, because there's some fix fix bridges that are ideal. So lower in sizes, for me, if the quantity and quality of enamel is equal on either side of the pontic, I may choose a fix fix design in some specific situations because I'm not worried about a differential rate of debond between those two retainers and the movement of those two teeth is pretty equal. Does that make sense, Chaz? 100%. And I think I just want to add to that. And I think what Salman's trying to say is that think of the way that, let's imagine you're replacing a central and you're going to use a lateral and the other central, then yes, the ligaments, the teeth want to move in the same direction. What you want to avoid, let's think about the scenario you want to avoid is doing a central with a canine, which you want to go in, in different ways, right? And that's when it's going to lead to more stress in the cement loop on one of those retainer wings. So yes, similar teeth that move in similar directions like lower incisors, I agree. And actually, Salman, I regret not choosing a fix fix on my own lower incisors. I regret it. Because? Because post orthodontic retention. So sometimes you want to do post orthodontic retention. Now, bit of history here. I do have a degree of mobility on my lower sizes, orthodontics in the past. It is a, a funny little thing. So for that reason, to give me a, some splinting effect and for a more predictable orthodontic uh, retention, which actually a little bit of gaps are opened up basically. So I wish I could have done that. And I think sometimes for the sake of orthodontic retention or stability when you're dealing with mobile teeth, it can be favorable. So don't think that, oh, just because someone said you can't do fix fix, it's not for all cases. There are certainly some indications. So Chad, I've got a few fix fix bridges to show you. Here you go. Uh, this is the first one. Um, this has been five years in situ, um, going from the canine to the first molar. And just to clarify, that is not a crown. It's kind of like an onlay. It's an onlay. It's an onlay, exactly. Yeah. So we actually needed to raise this patient's occlusion to restore, um, to place implants in the lower and posterior sections. Place the resin on the bridge on the upper as a temporary measure with an onlay to open up the bites. And actually what ended up happening was the resin on the bridge, the patient was so happy with it, she's refused to have it replaced. So this has been five years in situ. Can I, can I ask about that, Saman? Yeah. Path of insertion, like I'm trying to like imagine uh, bonding that. So th this four unit, technically four units, so two abutment teeth, mm -hmm. two pontics there. You're trying to place it on the six through a sort of vertical path of insertion, but the, the canine probably can. You probably just ensured there was some vertical path of insertion there. But uh, was that tricky to, to, to place? Not really, no. And you know what, uh, Jazz, like soft flex discs are really, really good for getting guide planes accurate. So we want resin on the bridges to be minimal prep, but sometimes just smoothing out like the mesial aspect of that six uh, with a soft flex disc and any areas of undercuts can just really help open up everything. There wasn't an issue at all. And Jazz, you mentioned about um, post orthodontic retention. What we sometimes do at the Eastman is when we have resin on the bridges anteriorly, on your metal retainer, you can actually create a little loop uh, for your fixed wire to go through. Um, mm -hmm. And that can still connect as part of the fixed retainer. Or you can do this, which is, a, it's actually a section from your paper. <laughs> you, you recognize this, Jazz. <laughs> it's a butterfly it. design. Uh, there we are. So centrals joined together as like double abutted, if you like, replacing two lateral incisors. Uh, I imagine this patient, well, I, I know this patient had a diastema or, or yeah. an unstable sort of a risk of opening up the diastema. And this is a really clever way to, to get retention as well. And I've got one last one to show you, Charles. This is actually another one of my mild, well, I'd say failure in my eyes, um, but it's a success mm. of the patient's eyes. 
great. Well, while you get that one, I'll just talk about a failure I had seven months ago, debonded on someone whose uh, dentures I replaced with a Resmar bridge anteriorly, a couple of them, central and a lateral. And the, the lateral came away from a canine because he went to the fridge, he had some cold chocolate and he rested it on his pontic and bit down. And so that was a freak action because he, he then realized that, oops, I wasn't supposed to do that on that tooth. And otherwise that's, yeah, don't get many failures, but one recent one share and that's how it happened. And here, here's on one jazz. So this is a patient who, once again, we were waiting for them to be suitable for implants. Uh, they were 17 years old, uh, we're waiting for. So the whole point, I'm sure people are aware with implants, facial growth continues uh, with life. And it's especially quick up to the age of puberty. So for men, we wait, usually wait till the age of 25. With girls, we wait till the age of about 21. Because if you place an implant too early and facial growth continues, you get relative intrusion of the implant, you get a much shorter clinical crown, and the gum levels don't equalize. So resin on the bridges we often use in NHS hospitals, even practice outside when we get referred them from orthodontics, like this patient was. But we need to delay the placement of implants and give them a fixed solution in the meantime. Now, this patient came in with missing upper laterals and upper canines, and I placed a fixed, fixed resin on the bridge from the central to the first premolar, and on the other side from the other central to the first premolar. Wow. So central, lateral, canine, premolar, that's, that's four units, four right? Unit. right? Four yeah. times two, yeah. <laughs> so we placed this, and you know, it opens up the bite really nicely, Jazz, but occlusion settled in about four weeks really quickly. And this patient actually decided to not go ahead with implant treatment five years later. So he's going to wait it out with these bridges because he's happy with the function. He's not getting any problems and he's not keen to undergo surgery. But my mistake in this case, and you might notice is look at the incisal translucency jazz. Um, I lost it. And this is the case where um, I was beginning to use Panavia. Um, I wasn't checking when my nurse was opening and I used tooth colored Panavia instead of opaque Panavia. Mm -hmm. I just made this resin on the bridge. And um, I had much greater loss of enamel translucency and I had this grain. Um, I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to clean this all up. Patient looked at it and said, I'm totally happy with it. It doesn't trouble me. And I said, let me know if it does. And it's been five years and it's still fine. Very good. But yeah, great point. Make sure you're using the right cement and use an opaque cement. Like, you know, me and you both use Panavia opaque by the signs of it, which is, yeah, which is a fantastic cement for that reason. But you still have to warn, even with the opaque cement, that, okay, there is going to be a degree of graying and it depends on the degree of translucency of that tooth yeah so yeah so another disadvantage of resin on the bridges there so yeah in lo loss of incisal translucency is an issue mm -hmm. it's often why if i'm replacing a lateral incisor my ideal abutment is nearly always the canine i don't like centrals for several reasons the first one is patients will often notice a mismatch between the two central incisors because they lose symmetry centrals have more incisal translucency and finally we said that the dial approach is unpredictable right it's very difficult to know which way teeth are moving and I have a feeling that sometimes when I fit a resin on the bridge wing high on the central, I think there's some element of labial shift of that central incisor going splaying. on. Some splaying. Some splaying. Exactly. And mm. patients will notice because it doesn't match the other central. That's a great reason to consider the canine. How about this whole mesial cantilever, distal cantilever? So when I, when I wrote that paper, I struggled for hours. My biggest time on research was finding good evidence to suggest that, other than just expert opinion, that the whole distal cantilever versus mesial cantilever actually has a wealth of evidence behind it. And I couldn't find anything, Saman. Are you aware of, uh, so just to clarify for those listening, so mesial cantilever would be like going from a first molar to a second premolar. You're cantilevering mesially. A distal cantilever would be going from a first premolar to a second premolar. You're cantilevering distally. So any guidelines in terms of to you, is it a relative disadvantage for you to go distal cantilever? So I think for me, like, firstly, we know that forces are greater at the back of the mouth, right? Always. And when we often fit our retainers in super occlusion, we want our pontics to be in very, very light guidance. Well, I say out of guidance in very, very light static occlusion. And I think it's very difficult to get that pontic in that occlusal scheme if you have a distal cantilever going backwards at the back of the mouth. It's more challenging to do that. And that will then put your cement in tension, which then leads you to a greater risk of debond. But that's just me logically speaking. Completely agree, there's not very much evidence. And Mesial and distal cantilever goes out the window when we look at the anterior part of the mouth, right? Centrals, laterals, canines, we don't consider yeah. it. It's not um, so important. Uh, yeah, I would, I would never consider replacing a second premolar off a first premolar. I can't see a case where I've seen that happen because I usually use the first molar and go mesially. Um, mm -hmm. But the only distal cantilever I do regularly is first premolar off the canine. And that's a regular okay. one that I do. Yeah, so I've, I've done a few of those as well, placing a first premolar from a canine, but I have seen a second premolar, I've seen quite a few actually, of second premolars 
being replaced by first three molars at Guy's Hospital when I was there. And it's, it's always because there was no molar to cantilever off, right? And the patient wasn't suitable for implants. So mm -hmm. they essentially did the short and dental arch principle by yes. using oh, resmo and bridges yeah. to distal cantilever off the first premolar. Now, one thing I remember my consultant uh, saying at one of those clinics was that actually she's noticed that the first premolar, you get a bit of a uh, mobility, not periodontal disease, a little bit of occlusal trauma, but it seems to be persistent and, and not progressing th throughout the years. Jazz, that's, that's very common in complete denture patients. So upper complete denture patients who are opposing lower four to four, I've often seen distal cantilevers off first premolars. And that's the only time I see it because obviously if you're opposing a complete denture, you've taken inclusive considerations into account and you're not expecting that risk of debond. So that's the common one that I've seen. And another lesson there you just shared is, yeah, if you're opposing a complete denture, go yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Do what yeah, you want. Yeah. Risky <laughs> cases. Same with anterior open bites. Yeah, take a risk. It's fine. But first, a canine uh, retainer on the canine pontic first premolar seems to work really well. Because canines naturally, you get a really good amount of enamel. You can implement in size or overlap. You've got good root length. So another contraindication to resin on the bridges for me is looking at the abutment tooth selection. So it might have good enamel, but looking at bone support, looking at crown to root ratio, I do take it a little bit into account. And because I know that I'm going to be putting that tooth in super occlusion when I'm relying on the dial approach. And if it's taking all the load, I need to make sure it can sustain that kind of load that it's going to take. Very good. And just last point before we talk about the, the clinical protocol, seeing some lower incisors with a bit of, bit of mobility, I find that as a good feature to have. If it's got a little bit of, so for example, periodontal disease, and they've had some little bit of bone loss, that for me is not a contraindication to resmoran bridges as long as the perio is controlled. But actually, it can act in our favor because what we find is that as the pontic is loaded, instead of the forces now going into the cement, it's actually going into the PDL of the tooth. It's a little bit mobile, so it gives a bit and then the cement gets loaded. So we think it's got a, a cushioning effect. Have you found that with these slightly grade one mobile patients that these, these are lasting well? Yeah, Jazz, uh, mobility is not a contraindication. For me, it's all about stability of periodontal disease. You're going back to those papers about like primary and secondary occlusal trauma that went through my first year of specialist training where they had these beagle dogs and they put the teeth in super occlusion and they found that any mobility you get from that occlusal trauma, from that heavy loading, is reversible mobility and there's no and all the pocketing is reversible as long as there's no bleeding or probing so it's all about periodontal disease stability and for me resin on the bridges are like the ideal solution for perio patients right because implants have we know about the complications even in stable perio patients implants will have a greater complication rate per implantitis is very expensive very difficult to manage and for me go to treatment for perio patients is a resin on the bridge once they're stable Brilliant. I'm definitely in agreement. So let's talk about the, the clinical protocol. Let's say you've done your design, you've opted for the incisal overlap. So what, what, what we mean, but just describe what you mean by the incisal overlap to someone who That's may not be really good this. for like listeners. I, I, I like my, the docket is in my head. Like I just, I just reel through it every time. I'm sure you're the same. Once you've got that docket in your head for your lab, I'm very, very prescriptive about how I design my resume on the bridges. So talk through the lab prescription then. Okay, so let's say we're a mock example. We're replacing a lateral incisor uh, off the canine tooth, right? So my lab prescription, let's say we're looking at metal porcelain resin on the bridge. So we're not looking at zirconia for now. First thing I do is I say, which teeth is the pontic, which tooth is the retainer? Because labs will get it mixed up because communication is not always the best. So pontic is this tooth, retainer is this tooth. And it's a two unit resin on the bridge in case they decide to go fix fixed suddenly, okay? Retainer design is then I say, I want a base metal alloy. So either cobalt chromium or nickel chromium. And I want it in minimum thickness of at least 0 0.7 millimeters. So for me, thickness is the really important thing. I found some labs, they try to fit your resin on the bridge into the occlusal scheme of the patient because they're worried about propping it open. And it's when your metal wing is too thin that you then get that tension, you get the flex and you get the debond. And what you really want is you want rigidity with your metal wings so that you don't get that tensile force on your cement. Just a little bit on that, Simon, before you continue the, the prescription, I went around uh, to an uh, unnamed lab, and I won't name the lab, and I was like, they had a whole table of reservoir and bridges, and I just started to go around. I got my ones engaged, started to measure these wings, okay? Not a single one was more than half a mil. So not a single one was more than 0 0.5 mil. And so we had a nice little chat about, okay, why it's important to, to respect that. Because that's what, you know, the papers have shown when they've followed that protocol, they've got success. So why not copy that? Charles, you like the CQC for resume on the bridges. That's a new job <laughs> title. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so retain your thickness. Um, and then I say, I want maximal coverage all the way to gingival margin. And I want maximal wrap around wherever possible. And for me personally, I want a little lip over the incisal edge, okay? Two benefits, I'm maximizing enamel 
and I'm also creating a bit of resistance form and it's a seating jig at the same time for me. So I know I'm going to cement it in the correct position. My Pontic design uh, would either be ovate Pontic or modified Ridgelap Pontic. So modified Ridgelap is my go-to for healed sites. Can you just, because the young dentist listening, so you, if you mentioned the incisal overlap, just want to touch on that and say, yes, uh, cover a third to a half of the actual incisal table, incisal ledge or the canine. Really, really great because it helps you to Should it, show it some acts examples, as a seating lug. Some... Yeah, show, pull up some photos as we're talking. It acts as a seating lug or, or gives you some index. So you're not, you know, sometimes when you go for a reservoir bridge without a incisal overlap or without a seating lug, you're sort of sometimes positioning, hmm, how's it go it kind of fits in multiple positions it overcomes that issue easily because it, it gives you something to grab onto inside the ledge so location wise it helps when the pontic is loaded now the cement is in compression so that's really a good feature as well so it's a great thing to do and aesthetically when a patient smiles against the the dark oral cavity behind the backdrop it kind of disappears but it's not for every patient i think it's fair to say yeah you can, you can always trim it back right so for me it's a seating jig and then i just trim back i gradually trim ask patient are you happy trim more trim more and usually i get to this kind of balance where i'm happy and the patient's happy with the aesthetics. And so I get both. And I'm not worried about trimming. Do you tend to trim it uh, the same day as a fit? I tend to do it at a yeah. review appointment. So I always got told to wait two weeks. For me, I've, I've not noticed any difference, Chaz. I, 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 so what I'll do is I usually wait a good 15 minutes, let it all set. Ox I, I'm really OCD. I, I literally won't touch it for a good five minutes on the OxyGuard. Then for the next 10 minutes, I'm taking my, usually post-op photos, uh, cleaning up all the excess cement, making sure the patient's happy. I give them all their post-op instructions. And then I start trimming back gradually. But um, okay. maybe a review is a safer thing to do. I know resin cement, yes, you should wait. Um, but I've not noticed an increase in B bonds. Can you see this photo here, Jazz, of this incisor overlap? Yes, perfect. There you go. So yeah, a, a great thing to do. And then, and then the next point uh, that you made, sorry, so we we're just talking about the incisal overlap and the importance, and then you switch gears and you're talking about Pontic. So for the young dentist listening, just can you explain what is a modified ridge lap design and what is an ovate Pontic? Jazz, last thing, sorry. Um, sandblasting uh, retainer wings is really, really useful. We're gonna, let's talk about that completely separately after you, because uh, we need to talk about that. Give it give it some love. To hide the metal shine for the incisor okay, overlap. Okay, fine, sorry, sorry. To hide, yeah, to hide the, <laughs> so yeah, that is relevant. To hide the, yeah, the, the shine, the, the sort of, the twinkle that when they smile basically uh, makes it yeah. more matte. Yeah, absolutely, spot on. So we always in the undergraduate, there's four different Pontic types. Um, but for me, the go-to is the ovate Pontic or some people might call it a bullet shaped Pontic. And the second one is the modified ridge lap. So the ovate Pontic is literally a totally convex uh, profile that sits against the soft tissues. It's shaped just like a tooth uh, underneath it in terms of the bulbosity. And the ovate Pontic is my go-to when I've got like an immediate resin on the bridge. So I've kind of taken an impression. I'm gonna fit my resin on the bridge two weeks later and the patient's got like a retained root in situ. And on the day of fit, I extract the tooth, I extract the roots. I've got a nice little space. I've asked the lab to create an ovate pontic with like a two millimeter extension into the socket. I fit it and then the soft tissues really nicely hug around that and you get a really nice natural emergence profile. The modified ridge lap is a, a technique where essentially buckety, you're following that ovate pontic design. You've got that nice convex profile, you're extending all the way aesthetically to where you want to be. But palatally, where the patient doesn't see, you're cutting back your pontic completely, just clear of the soft tissues. Theoretically, it's a more cleansable design. It's much easier to keep clean with floss and it's still got convex profile. But because you've got healed ridge, you can set a modified ridge lap against it without any issues. As time goes on and my patients are becoming more aesthetically concerned, I'm finding I'm going to more and more ovate pontics. So I'm doing a lot more soft tissue shaping and with Essex retainers or dentures to create an ideal emergence profile. And I'm going for an ovate pontic design. And some people used to say, oh, it's very difficult to keep clean, but as long as it's convex for me, it's very, very easy for patients. They don't get food shopping and they seem to like it better, which goes against my undergraduate teaching. Yeah, there was something really quite beautiful about removing that Essex retainer, which you've got the composite side to mold the soft tissue or the denture or however you want to do it, pick your poison and then take it out. And you see that lovely recipient area for the future Pontic just looks so natural in terms of emergence profile. Nowadays, what I'm doing is when I'm doing not a immediate reservoir ridge but just a routine let's switch your dentures for a reservoir ridge kind of thing i'm assessing the volume of soft tissue and i'm using a thermocut burr to just uh, heat and remove the sort of architecture of the pontic where i want it to be and that helps it to go not 100 percent ovate but like if, if between ovate and modified ridge lab you have a spectrum it goes more towards ovate but i agree that you need that convexity for cleansability because even modified ridge lab labs really find it a struggle to make it we ask them for a convex so i always say i want a convex fitting surface 
But actually, if you look at healed ridge, we need to empathize with our lab that it's almost impossible sometimes to get good aesthetics and a convex emergence profile. And it's no good us saying it to the lab and saying, achieve this. We have to help them along the way and create that profile that they need. It's, yeah, it's always working together. That's what it's all about. Brilliant. And then was there anything else on the lab docket that you so have mentioned? So we went to retainer, oh, occlusion. So I have a specific, so I've got retainer, one chapter, Pontic, one chapter. So I say, and then occlusion. So I say, I'm going for a conventional dial approach here. It depends on each patient. But I usually say, leave the retainer minimum 0.7 millimeter thickness in super occlusion. And the Pontic at this stage will be fully out of guidance and maybe lightly in occlusion. It is okay if other teeth are out of occlusion, essentially. I'm, I'm okay with that because I'm going for a full dial approach in this situation. Brilliant. You know what? We talk about lower resmar bridges, but you know what? They can be really tough to just like upper centrals, matching this upper central to another central or even mm. lower incisors. It can be yeah. really tough for ceramists. Yeah. So resin on the bridges. So if we're looking at specifically metal resin on the bridges, a set of photos helps massively. Um, the tips with metal are, I'm sure you noticed, just mirror handle behind that tooth. So holding a mirror handle behind the tooth and then taking your photos will mimic the lack of incisor translucency you're about to create in that tooth. Okay. I didn't actually know that. Uh, that's a tip for me, my friend. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the first one. Second thing, what I sometimes do, if I've got a really concerned patient, <laughs> I do a metal framework try -in. So I'll get the metal framework from the lab before they've cast the porcelain. I'll put that on the site. I'll take a photo and that'll mimic that metal behind. And if you want to be really extreme, which I haven't even done this yet, Jazz, but this is what you can do. You can paint Daikal on the metal framework. Yes. You can see it in the mouth. It, it mimics Panavia opaque. Take a that's photo. That's what I do. That, that, that's what I do. Yeah. Oh, is that what you do? Yeah. Okay. You're yeah, extreme yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't had to do it yet. But yeah, it works really well. It mimics Panavia opaque, right? And then you know. It, it does. And, and just on that topic, photos are really important. Uh, and I use the cross polarization filter like Elab. Uh, and that gives them a bit more in terms of getting the aesthetics right of the Pontic and, and seeing the, the deeper, removing the, the specular flash as well. So, yeah, that really helps in, in shade matching. Technicians seem to like it. Uh, one story about a consultant actually who taught me another thing with shade matching is that she fit a resmar bridge from a central replacing lateral. And the patient was like, mm, you know what, the shade's not right. And at that point, they bonded it. So, what she did was that she got a palatal non-precious metal veneer so a palatal non-precious palatal veneer for the contralateral incisor to make it look duller as well which i thought okay you know if you need a, a, another way to do it rather than cutting a bridge off why don't you stick something on yeah. so that was an interesting one just there you can hear your ideas for that yeah <laughs> <laughs> well in hospitals yeah hospital dentistry you can get away with a lot i think <laughs> no and then jazz i always say make sure there's a good contact point between the pontic uh, and the adjacent natural tooth because i feel like there's an anti-rotation part of resin on the bridges and when that contact point is good, I feel like I've got better stability. Absolutely. Have, having something next door with a, you know, something where you floss, you feel a nice contact will give it some some security. Uh, that's a, a yes. great point. And you know what? It's, it's good to mention that in the lab docket. So they just pay a little bit more attention to, okay, this was one of the requirements, one of Salman's requirements. I'm going to tick yeah. that off. So that yeah. helps technicians and, as well. And you might think it's OCD, but I've noticed, but my, like we use the same labs in practice, me and other associates, and the quality of work I always get back seems to be better and better and better because... The lab knows you're going to be checking this stuff. The lab knows you can. They know you're anal. They know you've got your Wanton gauge measuring yeah, yeah. the thickness. And I know, I know. Yeah, they yeah. do know. It does make a difference. And so, yeah, hold yourself to that standard. I agree. So let's briefly talk through the, the clinical protocol. You've got your resin bridge back. You've tried it in. You're happy with the shade. What are the, the little mini steps you're going to do to bond it, including with or without rubber dam? I'd like to know what you currently do. Okay, so um, anterior resin on the bridge. Yeah, we've tried it all in the patient's mouth. Happy with the fit. Patients confirm the shade. Um, you can actually get Panavia opaque try and pastes. I've got some recently, so I'll double check with that also. And, and also just on that point, really important to rehearse your try and rehearse it, practice how it goes in so that when the really important moment comes that you're not fiddling around, that you know, okay, this is how it goes in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for me, uh, Jazz, no rubber dam for, for bonding resin on the bridges. Actually, I've done it with rubber dam and without. I feel like it compromises the way in which I do it. I can't check complete seats. And for me, resin on the bridges are all about the proper seating because you want that cement uh, to be in minimum thickness. And if you don't seat it correctly, that's when you will get those debonds and de cements. I, I, I'm the same, no rubber dam, uh, occasionally split dam, especially for lower regions. You know, if I'm doing a lower premodel, for example, yeah. split dam has its benefits in keeping the tongue and stuff out of the way. But yeah, mostly, you know, rubber dam, Richard Porter taught me many years ago, rubber dam is either helping you or it's hindering you. And it comes to reservoir and bridges, I think it's hindering you because you want to go all the way up to the gingival margin or just shy of it. And it's just, that's exactly where the rubber dam wants to be. And I've done it before because I've done so many now where I put the reservoir bridge and I've pinched the bloody rubber dam, you know, into my reservoir bridge. I'm trying to pull it out. So yeah, <laughs> learned the hard way. 
rubber dam can sometimes get in the way. So my protocol for cementation is um, I ask my lab to extend the metal wing all the way to the gingival margin. On the day of cementation, what I then do is at the day of cementation, I place retraction cord. And that gives me that extra half millimeter to make sure I've exposed that bit of tooth so I can clear up any excess cement. So I don't take an impression for resin on the bridges with a retraction cord, because then it's a nightmare isolating and cleaning up excess cement on the day of fit, okay? The second thing I do is I do PTFE tape isolation, not on the Pontic side, but on the retainer side. So let's say I'm cementing a resin on the bridge, retainers on the canine, and the Pontic is the lateral incisor. I'll do a PTFE wrap around the first premolar uh, to make sure I don't block that contact point up. Then the protocol is for your metal-based resin on the bridges, I'm sandblasting with 50 micron alumina, and then applying an MDP alloy primer. So I think the Panadio V5, the new one, it's got its uh, combined clear for ceramic primer plus, has silane and MDP in it. Yep. Um, but that one's appropriate. You put that one on, you leave that uh, on the side for a couple of minutes while I work on the teeth. On the teeth then, I'll apply my etch. And then Air abrasion on the teeth? Oh, sorry, air abrasion first. Yeah, 27 uh, micron alumina, etch, and then apply my bond. Um, don't cure your bonding agent. If you, your tooth primer, again, for Panavia is my go-to. Panavia V5. Yeah, you don't need to cure that. Absolutely, you wait for the cement. The only other cement I've considered for resin on the bridges that I'm using is Reliax Ultimate, which I've used once or twice. And that's their protocol involves using Scotch Bond as the bonding agent of choice because they say it's universally adhesive, it contains MDP. If you are going to do that, don't cure the Scotch Bond on the tooth. The manufacturer says that if you once the Relax Ultimate mixes with the Scotch Bond, it creates like a self-cure setting reaction, which is pretty cool. But to be honest, my go-to is Panavia. I'm just used to the handling, it works, there's no reason to change it. Another top tip here from Lewis McKenzie taught me that the Panavia proper protocol is to get it out of the fridge. Hey, firstly, I post about this on, mm, on my story fridge. and people are like, wait, it's supposed to live in the fridge? I'm like, yeah, it's supposed to live in the fridge. Okay, so take it out of the fridge about 15 minutes before you need it. That allows it to reach a more appropriate temperature, which apparently reduces how many bubbles you're going to get. So yes, use whichever cement okay. you want as long as it has got MDP and you are familiar and comfortable with the full protocol. That's, I think, the main message. Uh, but yeah, if you want to know what we use, Panavia and I've also used Relax ultimate as a two. I haven't used anything else and nor would I want to for Reservoir and Bridge. If I didn't have those two and for some reason I was working in practice, I, I would actually change the appointment. I wouldn't fit it. I wouldn't fit them. I've, I've just, I've had to order it into a practice. I'm, I started a new practice. I had to order it in the first day. I thought I can't actually work without this. Panavia for me, like there's different types, right? So there's Panavia V5, which is a new one, which I'm really enjoying actually. It works really, really well. Other people might be using Panavia F, Panavia 2.0. Make sure you don't use Panavia SA, the Panavia self-adhesive version. That's the only Panavia that's not suitable for resin on the bridges. I, I didn't know that because I've never used it. So that's really good to know, actually. So in case you think you've got Panavia or oh, I've got Panavia and if it's an SA version, then as someone says, don't use it for resin on bridges. Very good to know that. I think when it comes to cements, you have to be a little bit anal in terms of respect what, what the literature works well and what works in people who've experienced hands. And my principal, my old Mike's principal, 30 plus years, he's been using Panavia for donkey's years, basically for at least the last 15 years. So, you know, use these cements that have got a good proven track record. Yeah, you're already taking a risk with this adhesive dentistry. If you're going to do it properly, you've got to divide the book in this case. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've put it in uh, and I like to really pinch with my finger and the thumb, the abutment tooth and the, the wing, the retainer together and really make sure it's really well seated. I don't do anything else. I don't start tidying up just yet. How about you? Yeah, same thing. So my consultant used to tell me that after you've cemented a resin on the bridge, your finger should be hurting when you take it off <laughs> after five minutes. That's how you know you cemented it properly. And the reason why incisor overlap helps so much is you know you've got full seating because when that cement goes, you, it's very, very difficult. It's surprisingly difficult to spot whether you, sometimes you get like a shift in the bridge, you can't tell. That incisor overlap, once it's seated, I know I'm in the right position and then I can just hold it over there. Absolutely. And oh, one more thing I forgot to mention about uh, cement. I believe I'm very cynical and I believe that or the only reason Corare who manufacture Panavia, the only reason they sell 2.0 and all the other ones is because people still buy them. And should they stop making it because V5 is the newer, better, sexier version, should they stop making it, there's a risk that they'll stop buying and they might then switch to another cement. So these manufacturers, the reason they make older generations still is because people still buy them. And that's why I think. So I, I think if you're gonna buy the, for the first time, just buy V5. Yeah, for me, it's V5, the th great thing about it is it comes in different colors, right? So you get uh, like a variety of colors if you buy the full kit and then you can use it for your other bonding protocols. So gold, non-precious metals, ceramics, zirconia, resin on the bridges, you're basically covered in that one kit of V5. But I know at the hospital, we're not switched to V5 yet. <laughs> so yeah, people are using it. So yeah, Whoever's in charge of ordering through. has still got the old system and no one's yeah. changed it and no one, yeah, so no one dares change. touch it. Right, so occlusal check. So you obviously have been careful in terms of clean up, micro brushes, probe, anything, any fancy clever tips for when it comes to clean up? So clean up for me, so 
I, I think V5 has a tack here um, mode, right? So I do a slight mic here off it. So then it helps me do a bit more of the cleanup before it gets to full sets. But otherwise, I'll be honest, Jazz, I don't want to take my finger off that retainer wing when I'm cementing. That's my priority. And so cleanup is a bit of a headache. So I call the patient back two weeks later to do another thorough clean. And that's when I am worried. I don't start scaling around the bridge uh, straight away after fit. That's the two weeks later. Uh, I, I, and I do find excess cement. And it does happen with resin on the bridges because I'm so OCD about just making sure I've seated in the right position. And the PTFE will mean that my contact points are fine. I've got TP brushes on the side. I use TP brushes for all my cementations now. That's Same. like a regular Same. protocol I've got. And then hand sickle scalers. They work really well. Yep. And as I'm pinching and holding the reservoir bridge, my nurse, it will, you'll be using the long handled TP brush, pink one, to just go inside in between the teeth as I'm still pinching. And that helps to get rid of some of the, the bulk there as well. Only caveat is that if for some reason you've got some inflammation, just be careful with bleeding, basically. Yeah. I've got about 10 micro brushes for every fit <laughs> for resin yeah. on the bridges. Yeah. So I keep 10 because I like I think we're very each similar time I pick that. up cement. Yeah. I use a fresh one for each time because if you've gone through one, you don't have to wipe with the tissue, you just end up smearing panavia everywhere. And it sticks to everything. So yeah, it's a fresh micro brush each time I use it and you just keep going through them. It might not be the most environmentally friendly thing to do, but yeah, in this case, I'm okay with it. <laughs> in terms of occlusion checks, to what degree are you checking and adjusting as you just fit the reservoir bridge and it's fresh? So this is around becoming a bit more reasonable, I, th I think so. So I know my lab, if I'm going for the dial approach, has made me a, a really thick retainer at this stage. Um, which is a minimum of 0.7 millimeter thickness. So when that patient bites together, I'm expecting essentially all my contacts and maybe one at the back, which is possible sometimes, to be on that metal wing. And I'm definitely not expecting any contact on that pontic. So the only adjustment I'll usually make is that pontic. If there's any occlusion on there or I can get it into a guidance pattern, I'll make an adjustment to that pontic to get it out of guidance. So get it out of any excursion, right? Anything yes, dynamic exactly. on that pontic, get rid of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, even if it looks heavy to me, I lighten it, like let's say I want it like almost shim drag. You know how we have implant crowns? Very similar with that resin on the bridge pontic. And that's how light I want the occlusion. So I don't like prepping for resin on the bridges. And I know some people say it's only 0.7 millimeters. Why not just reduce the tooth a little bit and you can stop relying on dial as much. And I do see that, but it's very difficult if you prep to then maintain that space until your next visit. So what I'll sometimes do is if I think a bit of prep is required for this specific situation, I'll consent the patient at the impressions appointment that I might adjust a little bit of your opposing tooth on the day of fit. Yep, absolutely. That, that, and they know it's not like an, if you say it too late, it's an excuse, right? But if you say it before, it's an explanation or all, all that stuff. So yeah, you warn them at the impressions appointment. And, and very often you look at the opposing tooth and there's a nice, sharp, useless piece of enamel <laughs> that's unsupported that just is begging for a soft like this to it. Yeah. And that'll give you, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters sometimes. Or ideally a restoration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ideally, or well, ideally restoration, but yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid to polish any sharp enamel bits to give them my yeah. space. So that's an, often, uh, as young dentists, we're scared, you know, they're scared to look at the opposing and adjust it. But if you make a calculated decision and you communicate it from the beginning, then that is another neat way to gain a bit of space and not have to rely on dials so much. So uh, absolutely, that, that that's brilliant. So we've covered which cement as well, which is brilliant. We've covered the clinical protocol. Uh, in terms of the occlusion- There's one last thing I wanted to mention. Yes, please. I, I, I forgot to mention connector thicknesses. Yes. Connector thickness is really crucial. Even on the lab prescription, I'd actually write ensure maximal height of connector possible in this space, ensure maximal thickness. Because once again, with the metal based resin on the bridges, you're trying to avoid any flexion of that metal. And for me, like connector thickness, making it as like thick as possible makes it rigid, means I get less deep ones. Now, connect connector, Salman, like young, young dentists, when I was probably a year qualified in dental school, I would not have been able to tell you what the connector even is. Right. So mm. when it comes to a bridge connector, reservoir and bridge, can you just highlight exactly what you mean by the connector, which part of the connector and what do you mean by the height and also why the, the width of it is, is, is often underappreciated? So the connector is the, the bit of um, metal in a resin on the bridge that connects the pontic to that metal wing. Okay, it's that bridge of metal you have between the two. Now we look at it from an apical coronal dimension and a buccolingual dimension for the connector. Right. So if you're looking at case selection for resin on the bridges, if you've got a perio patient with very, very triangular teeth, big black triangles, you know, your connector might be limited in the apical coronal dimension. You may be limited in terms of height of the connector. And so once again, that might preclude you. That might say you don't do a resin on the bridge in this case because your connector will be so thin. And this patient is not going to accept any metal show in that black triangle 
limiting your or connector height. Or you do some proximal adjustment if you can to uh, reduce yes. that bracket triangle yes. and then increase the height of the the connector. Yeah, increase the height of the connector in the apocochorneal direction. So yeah, that that can sometimes work to detriangulize a, a tooth. You you stole my point, Jazz. Ah, oh, bloody hell! Sorry, <laughs> so, yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I forgive you. <laughs> so adjusting, yeah, and also buccolingual. So adjusting these teeth sometimes they're very convex. Like you know molars when you're placing second premolars, you have very convex uh, mesial wall. If you flatten the soft flex disc, you get greater connective thickness, both buccally, uh, buccopalatal, and you get better part of insertion also. So you get maximal wraparound. And so all these factors come into my mind. So that's connective thickness. So aesthetics also is an issue. Like sometimes to maximize connector heights, you're going to compromise aesthetics. If you've got very triangular teeth, very short teeth. And that's also why pontic site shaping even makes a difference. Because if you shape your pontic sites, you get a greater connector height. And I think the studies show, Jazz, there's like a law of beams, but connector height is the most important factor. Uh, compared to connector width. So for me, connector height is always what I'm most concerned about, but we look at it in cross section. So I want a minimum of about nine millimeters squared cross section uh, from metal based resin on the bridge in terms of connector dimensions. It becomes even more important. I think metal is very forgiving, man. I think with the zirconia, zirconia when we go to zirconia, yeah. you really, really, really have to really maximize as much as you can, not only the height, but the, the width as well. And that yes. may even impact on your aesthetics a bit because of how thick that connector needs to be. So really, really crucial because the most common modes of failure of zirconia reservoir bridges is fracture of the framework, which I've seen before. I've got some photos of it. Anything you want to add to when we start thinking about zirconia? Let's just finish on zirconia and how we're changing our protocols perhaps for zirconia. Because because for metal, for your resin on the bridge, your hard aim is to get rigidity. You know about metal fracturing. With zirconia, it's a naturally rigid material. But you still need to steadily have to worry about thickness because then you're worried about fractures rather than rigidity with zirconia. With zirconia, once again, like it is new to a lot of people. When I make a zirconia, Resin on the bridge, I specify to my lab what type of zirconia they should be using. So it has to be three wide zirconia. And for zirconia resin on the bridges, because it's going to be three wide zirconia, it'll be opaque. So I'm expecting them to be layering porcelain. And if they're layering porcelain, then you want to ask them to make sure the porcelain is well supported to reduce your risk of fractures. Yeah, that, that's a great point. So if you haven't listened to already the Ed McLaren episode, I think it's 117. Please check it out if you want to learn about 3Y, 4Y, 5Y. So a great point. You want to use this, the strongest, technically least aesthetic, but that's the monolithic component. When you layer it with your layering ceramic, then you get that lovely aesthetic. So a great point. Yeah. Is there anything different that you're doing, even when you're maybe your preparation design or any other factors that could be different to what we discussed in the previous parts of this episode, comparing metal-based reservoir bridges? So what's interesting, if you look at Zirconia resin the bridges and the evidence, uh, Matthias Kern's got like quite a few uh, long distance study, long term studies looking at success of zirconia resin on the bridges. Now, the King paper I mentioned earlier looked at metal based resin on the bridges and came up with like an almost about 80% success rates. While well, Matthias Kern comes up with a more than 90% success rate at over 10 years with his zirconia resin on the bridges. But firstly, like case selection. So the King paper looks at ants. This is where, like, I guess specialist training comes really into it, as you can kind of critically evaluate papers because. The Matthias Ken paper looks at specifically anterior based resin on the bridges with pre existing adequate interocclusal space. And if they didn't have it, they'd prepare the teeth to reduce the reliance on the dial approach. So they have a very specific preparation protocol. And it was done by, I think, more experienced clinicians. While the NHS hospital based PA King paper fitted metal based resin on the bridges all over the mouth, all kinds of designs on NHS patients treating hyperdontia with no preparation at all. And so my go-to bridge for predictability for my patients is still metal-based resin on the bridges. And zirconia, I still feel very hesitant prepping teeth for a zirconia resin on the bridge. Because for me, the whole benefit is a non-invasive solution to meet this patient's treatment need. Because then when that mode of failure happens, it's not catastrophic and I've got a fallback option in the future. But I know his paper specifically has its preparation protocol and I'll follow certain elements of it. So with zirconia... I've realized my lab cannot finish it to such a nice knife edge margin. So I'm considering a small chamfer prep or a finish line for the seating of the bridge. And you can't have an as nice an incisor overlap with zirconia because with metal, you can thin it down with the bar really nicely. With zirconia, I don't want to be adjusting because I'm worried about subsurface cracking. So I want to make sure that when I fit that zirconia bridge, I want to do minimal adjustment. So I may not go for that full incisor overlap because I then don't want to be cutting things back. I don't have to polish it to a knife edge because zirconia doesn't work in thin section. Contrary to what people tell you, it does crack, it does splinter. And so you want a nice thick section resin on the bridge with zirconia that you fit and you forget about it and you know it's fully seated on that date. So that, that's my kind of thought process behind what I do for zirconia.
Yeah, brilliant. I'd say the same. The only thing I also want to add to that is when you're looking at your preparation of your abutment. Now, most of these, all I'm doing is a soft flex disc, like we said, proximal wall, get a nice guide plane. But I, I would just, you know, you know where the metal, like let's say you're replacing a canine from a first you do a premolar. Box, don't you? You do a uh, not box not from, even the box actually. Yeah. No, the box is, is, is there uh, to maybe to give you the connector width and whatnot. But it's more the fact that as the metal transitions up the platal wall to the actual uh, cusp as well, if that transition is sharp, for metal, I might accept it. It's okay. But for the zirconia, mm. I'm going to get yeah. a you know yellow or red microfiber and just smooth it. Make it make the internal walls as smooth as possible, which is better for the ceramics, basically. That's the only other difference that comes to prep. I'm just casting that one more eye, okay, feeling my finger. Is it in sharp? With metal, it doesn't make a big difference to me. Metal can tolerate that. Yeah. Anyway, metal is good. Like You want as much of those random surface features as possible for metal because you're getting that mechanical retention from these. With ceramics, yes, you want the smooth flowing curves you see people do for overlays. The same thing. I'm still, like, I've done quite a few zirconia resin on the bridges now. Metal is still my go-to. I don't know how it is for you guys. Like, the more I do, I still feel like when I fit that metal bridge, that, that seat still feels, maybe I'm just old school in the way I do it. I know I need to do more zirconia. Even when I can send my patients, I say there's these two options. One's more predictable, one might be more aesthetic. If you don't mind aesthetics, this is the one to go for. And if they pick the zirconia one, I'm still lowering their expectations massively because for me, it's still new. I still don't have those... 10-year data studies for zirconia that make me back that type of uh, resume on the bridge design. But uh, as I move more into private practice and I see more and more patients, they're refusing metal for the first time. And I'm noticing mm -hmm. it more and more and more. I don't know, post-COVID, people seem to be looking at their smiles on Zoom. They're actually saying, I'll never have a metal wing. When beforehand, they'd be quite happy to have one. I'm the same. So I say to my patients, do you want beauty or do you want longevity? Uh, but it, which is a lie because we know the current paper shows that it can work. And I, I believe in zirconia bonding and whatnot. But I, you know, I, I do agree. At the moment, I'm 50-50. So it's 50% chance whether I go zirconia or metal. Uh, some years ago, it was like 100% you know, metal, obviously, then it transitioned a bit more zirconia. Now I'm about 50-50. But if I could have it my way and uh, keep my risk lower, then I still bias metal. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, but maybe I mean, we'll, we'll speak again in five years and see if that changes. Any case where I'm pushing the limits, which yes. you'll see from my Instagram, I do quite a lot sometimes. Anything risky, then definitely don't risk your material. Exactly. That's essentially it, yeah. So I did a, I did a perio splint case. Uh, you might have seen Jazz. I had a patient come in. This is a really interesting case. So I can pull up the photo of it, Jazz, if you want. Go for it, go for it. Actually, Jazz, if you look at this, this is an, this is an Ovate Pontic. This is what you get mm -hmm. with immediate resin on the bridges. So this is a lateral incisor there. Lovely. And oh, here you go. All right, this is a really interesting patient. Can you see that, Jazz? Yes, yes. Mm. So um, this patient was a really interesting patient who came in to see me in private practice and said he wanted a replacement of his lower left central and lower left lateral incisors. But he'd gone to see five other people for consultations beforehand. He hated the denture he had at the moment. He wanted a fixed solution. But his lower right one and lower right two were grade one mobile, but periodontally stable otherwise. He had actually had perio work done. He said it'd been mobile for the last 10 years. And his main criteria was he did not want to lose any natural teeth because all the implant dentists he'd seen earlier had told him in order to do implants for this case, you need to remove the lower right central, lower right lateral incisors and have a two to two implant bridge for this to work. And we had a long chat about his expectations and what he actually wanted. And after a while, it, the patient just wants a fixed solution and he's happy for redos, remakes. And his main criteria is anything fixed that can work that also allows me to stabilize lower right one and two, that'd be amazing. And so in these cases, perio splints using resin on the bridges can work really well. And aesthetically, yes, metal is a compromise when this patient's open really big and looks in his mouth, you'll see this metal lingually. But for a patient in his mid-60s, a male patient, they just want fixed teeth and they want function. And he's actually more comfortable with this resin on the bridge now because the lower right one and two are stable and his lower left one and two are pontic. So I've done a six unit resin on the bridge from the canine to the canine. I mean, that's some lovely ceramic work. You see the mimicking the, you know, root root dentine, root cementum. Uh, that's really lovely. But if you, again, if you, you know, obviously it's not so important in this case. I'm sure it looks good in, in, in conversational distance. But if you look at that, the value is a bit high and stuff like that uh, compared to the natural teeth. It's really difficult to get the shade perfect. Now, obviously in any sort of dentistry, yeah, but I always difficult. find it, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I always look at, I've, I've yet to do a resonant bridge and I thought, you know what? absolutely nail the shade it's really difficult you know like you're replacing centrals and in any case it's, it's really tricky yeah no exactly yeah and and jazz like once again like the risk of failure you, you're back to where you started or worst thing you lose that is, yeah it's something you can always fix in-house and do something else and the more implants i do the more resume pictures i'm doing that's what i'm finding and this that's isn't nice just a one. podcast just to say like don't do implants and implants are all these negatives because they're amazing treatment solutions but it's really nice to have different tricks 
for each and every patient. And all your consults involve you giving a unique solution to each specific patient scenario. And that's what makes pros so interesting, right? Because this is problem solving all the time. Mm. Absolutely. No, I think we covered a, a lot of ground there at Resmaran Bridges. Someone, uh, I think you do some teaching on, on Resmaran Bridges. Tell us more about some courses that you run. So if anyone listening can, can, can attend one of those, I'm a big fan of going to live courses like yourselves. Well, actually, this is a shout out to Jazz, isn't it? Because <laughs> so Resmaran Bridges is like a passion of mine because of the thesis I'm doing currently. And yeah, I've run a few webinars and you can message me on Instagram at dental underscore story to find out more. But really, I, I messaged me and Jazz were talking about resin on the bridges, and I said, Jazz, I don't know if I want to do a podcast because you run a really, really amazing course on resin on the bridges, and I don't want to be to any conflict of interest. But actually, Jazz is such a welcoming person; he's invited me on to speak about resin on the bridges as well. So I'd say, message me, message Jazz, because he runs an RBV masterclass, which a lot of my colleagues have actually gone on and said it's an amazing course to go on. But generally, I think the main thing I want is I just see patients coming in with like perio patients with implants, implant complications. Patients who have not been offered this treatment modality, and especially the more international patients I'm seeing, it's such a nice thing to offer our patients that will solve so many of their problems that I think we have a duty to offer these patients the options. And that's really the main reason for this podcast. Um, I just feel like something everyone should be aware about. It's a really good way of making good money in a minimally invasive way. Hey, let's way. talk. We haven't talked about money. I mean, if you can, just let's talk about uh, money. If you don't mind revealing this, how much will you charge yeah. uh, privately for Resmaran Bridge? So, Jazz, even if I go privately, so uh, NHS mixed practice. If a patient came in with one missing tooth or needed an immediate denture, for example, which would be the go-to solution, I'd be the guy in the practice thing, the immediate resume on the bridge. Because even on a band three charge for patients, which I think at the current is like 280 pounds, it's still for me more predictable and more profitable than doing an immediate denture. Because immediate dentures, you often have that replacement, the redo. And as long as you warn patients for immediate resume on the bridges, yes, you may need this redone in about six months when everything heals up and we can do another one at that stage. It's perfectly fine. So even at that is profitable. When private practice, from using my private laboratories, chair side time is about half an hour. Yeah, it's a 15 minute scan impressions and photos for the shave. By the way, uh, I've discovered today that Salman is like Speedy, Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Speedy Gonzalez, right? So uh, anything that Salman does, you triple it for the time that I need. But yeah, just, anyway, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> Yeah, my, my main criticism at the hospital is I need to slow down. But it's just how I've always worked. Spending years in NHS practice, you just want to do these things for these patients. But 15 minutes for impressions, photos, scan, and then maybe another 15 minutes. To be honest, my main resume on the bridge part of the appointment is a consent discussion. It's like a good 15 minute chat of photos of showing them what it looks like. If it does come off in the future, they come in and say, you know what, it's come off. Exactly what we discussed. Let's do what we discussed, either remake or re-cement. And then the fit visit is about 30 minutes, but I'll book 45 if there's any issues. But I know and it's a very relaxed appointment. There's no injections. You can try and everything properly. You can do cement nicely and you review again for 15 minutes a few weeks later. My charge for resume on the bridges is about, depends, I work at three different practices, but usually about, I'm charging about 900 pounds because at my hourly rate for implants, it ends up exactly the same. So I have no bias. Like even my crowns in practice, I charge exactly the same for every single crown I do because I want to select what's best for my patient and there not to be any financial really discussion involved. It's just, I think this is what suits you. This is my recommended option. These are your other options. What would you prefer? And I don't mind which one they pick. Mine's from from 900 for sure. Like, odd time, I'm doing a very high demanding patient, central in size if I'm getting zirconia, you know, up to 1400 sometimes. So the range is there. Yeah. So the, the lesson here, guys, is that don't think that it's Resmaran Bridges and, and, and therefore it's, it's, gonna, it's a cheap thing. You're still replacing a patient's tooth. You're still enabling a patient to smile. I Because the, the common thing I found our colleagues do is undercharge and not feel confident to charge privately for Resmaran Bridges, which is ridiculous. You're giving a patient a freaking tooth. I think you have, you have a tendency to undercharge when you're not sure something's going to work. And that's usually mm. when you get the biggest problems of all. Charge appropriately, you have the time for reach. Like, you know, the best thing is with resin on the bridges, you know, when a patient comes for a crown fit and it doesn't fit, the shade's not right, and you're taking a temporary off, remake a temporary, re cement. With resin on the bridges, they come in for the try. And I call this, I call the fit visit a try in visit. So the patient thinks they're coming for Great a try in. And then I tell them, okay, everything's perfect. You know what? We can fit this today. And it's like another mm -hmm. positive on top of that appointment. Mm -hmm. While if it's a try and they come in, you try the shade, there's no temporary to worry about. There's no like excess cement to remove. You try it and you're like, you know what? Color's not perfect. Take a photo come back in two weeks. There's no pressure on you whatsoever. And it's a really satisfying thing to do for patients. No injections. Like it's such an easy like, thing to offer. It is a fantastic 
massively underutilized treatment modality. So I think those listening in the UK, they, they all know this stuff, right? Yeah, we went for a few little details and gems, which I'm sure they picked up, but this is really for you guys in the States, Petrusrati in the States, Petrusrati, Australia Petrusrati should be pretty good with this. They're pretty hot on this. Scandinavian, good. But yeah, US guys, come on guys. You know, we, we, we love you so much from across the pond, but you guys need to appreciate that resin and bridges can play a role in your practice. So please do follow at dental underscore story, check out his cases, check out Salman's webinar. I had a patient from Canada came on my webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago. A patient um, from Canada? Uh, not patient, not patient, sorry, not patient, <laughs> dentist. <laughs> I've said in practice mode. Um, dentist from Canada came on my webinar a few weeks ago, said he'd never provided a resume on the bridge, been quality for about 15 years. It's like, I've, yeah, so I run like a two and a half hour webinar on resume on the bridge. It's just an A to Z of everything start to finish. Um, and at the end of it, it's providing them like constantly, like, cause you, as soon as you provide something, you suddenly see these cases popping up everywhere. And when you get the confidence to provide something, you suddenly start offering it to your patients. And it's a duty of consent that we do offer these treatment modalities. And it's not something you need to refer out, it's something any general dentist can provide to a really, really high standard with good lab communication. And I think lab communication makes up 90% of it because we're not doing much in the chair. But it's the interaction between you and your lab you need to get right and you can get amazing results. Resorbrand bridges are minimally invasive. They are time efficient, patients high satisfaction. And if you play your cards right with communication, it, it works well in the long term. And I do think, you know, even by saying that last little bit, if you, you know, communication, blah, blah, I'm not saying we get a lot of debonds at all. They are incredibly successful. But as long as they know not to do anything stupid, then you get the real success, I think, because as long as you've got a uh, case selection is good, occlusion, enamel, your right prescription, you, you really can't go wrong unless the patient has a fall or eats cold chocolate from the fridge exactly on your pontic. I think I've had two failures, Chaz. One on a broxist, uh, replacing a posterior tooth, pushing the boundaries, and the other one bonding to existing composite on adjacent teeth. I've probably placed over, I think I'm over 200 now. I keep an audit somewhere off these, but yeah, of patients who I know of, two out of 200 is not bad. I'm sure the rest would come back <laughs> if there was a deep one because I haven't moved practices. I'm still at the same place. That is a really powerful in terms of learning. And uh, I, I think this is this is what I'm finding with Giles who used to work where I said before, so many bridges out there in Reading at the moment and I see them for checkups and they're still there and they're doing great. So uh, patients do not need to worry about it being a short-term thing. You need to change your mentality, guys, as long as your case selection is good because if your case selection is crappy, you'll get a crappy result. So Salman, thank you so much for making time for this. I really appreciate it. Always, always great to chat with you and show, see your funky cases, pushing the boundaries and whatnot. Of course, uh, talking through the more straightforward stuff as well. Really great. Looking forward to our third one, Chaz. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much <laughs> Absolutely. for having me. <laughs> well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. I always appreciate it so much. If you liked what you heard, but you want to learn more, you want to see some more cases, you want to spend a couple more hours with Salman, then check out his webinar on Resborn Bridges happening on the 4th of December. I'll put the link below. So if you're on my website or the app, or if you're on Spotify, you can read the description and find that link to get on the webinar. It is an absolute bargain. If you missed the webinar and you're listening to some point in the future, then you can also check out rbbmasterclass.com. That's my online course for Resbar and Bridges. I do recommend the live interaction that you get with Salman on his webinar. I think it's always fantastic to have these things live where you get to ask questions and it, you're kind of committed to be there and give your full attention. But if you missed that and you want to have something that you can access on demand for the rest of your life, then you've always got the online course. That's rbbmasterclass.com. That course is £97. That includes tax and whatnot. And it's roughly around about $110 US. But I'll teach you how I do these bridges. And I charge about 12 to 13 times more than that for a single resin and bridge and how you can feel confident in charging that to your patient because you have faith because ultimately you're providing patient with a tooth you're providing a patient with a replacement for a missing tooth that's a big deal and that's why I teach that you should be charging appropriately for resin and bridges and definitely not underselling yourself one last thing is that if you listen all the way to the end and if you're listening or watching on Protrusive Premium on the app guys if you haven't downloaded the Google Play or the Apple app download Protrusive app and make a free account. But if you want to get CBD and the exclusive content, please do subscribe. It'd be great to have you as a Protruserati on there. And you can claim CBD now. Just scroll below and answer the four questions. My team will send you a certificate and you'll always get access to episodes first before anyone else. So thank you again for being a true Protruserati listening all the way to the end. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. 